In my previous video, I mentioned how the Texas Chainsaw Massacre seems to capture a moment that might criticize something other than the present criticism towards broadcast media. In the final shot of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, our final girl, Sally, stares into the camera and cries and or laughs maniacally. In this moment, it feels as if Sally is no longer staring at the sight of the torment she just survived, but rather, she's staring at us. She stares at the real source of her trauma, our desire to witness such things occurring in film, the demand of the audience. Many films have tackled the idea of the implicated subject. The implicated subject is a term coined by Michael Rothberg in his recent book, The Implicated Subject, Beyond Victims and Perpetrators. In short, Rothberg defines the implicated subject as an individual who is not a direct agent involved in trauma and harm, but rather inhabits, inherits, or benefits from such relationships occurring around them. Though we often see trauma through the structure of victim and perpetrator, Rothberg proposes that most of us do not fit in these two molds. We do exist around them though, therefore making us responsible to these cycles of violence to a certain degree. One film that deals with the implicated subject in a direct, effective manner is Michael Haneke's Funny Games. Funny Games is a highly self-aware, intense, home invasion horror movie that lets its agenda of commenting on the audience's role as an implicated subject be known throughout the course of the film via fourth wall breaks from the perpetrators present in the film, Paul and Peter. The audience is forced to sit through a grueling experience of watching an entire family be tormented over the course of a night, all while having their role in the violence called out to them. This film is rather divisive, which I feel speaks to the tricky nature of its subject matter and its creative approach. Haneke actually made this film twice, which I also find interesting. Though the original was released in 1997 and was an Austrian production, our exploration here will focus on the 2007 American remake, also made by Haneke and is practically a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Why is this? Why remake the same film 10 years later? Well, the first part of this video is going to explore why that is and what it says about implication, and the second part will explore Funny Games' approach to the implicated subject more directly. Welcome to Analysis with Alex, a YouTube channel that aims to provide you lengthy video essay exploration in the form of units to provide a more rich exploration into certain topics that you might be interested in and that you might normally be used to. This video is part of a series titled The Terror of Trauma, which explores horror films that deal with the theme of trauma in some manner. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to go back and watch my other videos around this subject matter. There's even a playlist to help you access them more easily. Also, it typically helps if you've seen the movie before I talk about it. However, I will talk about funny games more as a cultural artifact here, rather than focusing on the film techniques present in it. Although, I will link a couple of video essays that pay more attention to its film techniques if that interests you. All of my references that I use here will also be linked in the description for you. Before we get into Funny Games further, if you value this channel as an educational resource and you want to join up on more explorations, please hit the subscribe button so you know when more explorations and videos are released. So why remake a film that you've already made 10 years ago? Haneke has been given this question often throughout his career and his reply in a 2008 interview with Filmmaker Magazine is as follows. Quote, because when I did the first Funny Games, it was intended to be for a public of violence consumers in the English-speaking world, but because it was in the German language, the film stayed always in the art houses, and so it didn't reach the public that it would have needed to. I had this proposition from Chris Cohen to remake it with an English-speaking cast, and for that reason I said, okay, maybe now the film will come to the right public. When asked about how he specifically saw Funny Games as a movie that was dealing with American issues and what impact he hoped this had on an American audience, Haneke stated, quote, A film can do nothing but in the best case it can provoke so that some viewer makes his own thoughts about his own part in this international game of consuming violence because it's a big business. So maybe one or other person will ask, what am I doing when I'm working for this? Why am I working for this? That's the top from the possibilities. I'm not a social worker. I think both these ideas come through the film in a few different ways. 
One is that Haneke almost seems to be making fun of the art house appropriation of films like this through the rather pompous social elite family guessing what opera pieces they are listening to at the start of the film before it cuts into a noisy avant-garde grindcore song from Naked City. Grindcore and heavy metal being typically seen as more lowbrow, opera typically seen as more highbrow and elite. Through these song choices, Haneke seems to signify what this movie actually is, a mixing of what is typically considered highbrow and lowbrow art. Another way to see this is through the strange conversation between Paul and Peter towards the end of the film. During this scene, Paul proposes that the film showing various realities that Peter was describing to him is in fact all reality. This moment points to the varying realities of funny games at play. The original version, the American version, the fourth wall breaks toward the audience that are present in both of those films are all in fact reality. It's a strange, vague moment of metacinema that seems to get at why Haneke has made this movie twice. Funny enough, it seems Haneke's concerns about how Funny Games is viewed by the art house, more elite critic society rings true to a degree when observing the differences between the critic scores online for both films. It also speaks to this concern when considering one of the articles consulted here comes from the Criterion Channel's website. I'll link the article below as it deals with some of our interest with this film and it does make its case of only looking at the original as superior because the 2007 remake makes its characters too two-dimensional, though that may be somewhat debatable given the films are so much alike. Given the interesting background of why Haneke decided to remake this film for American audiences, we can jump into Funny Games' central message, which it makes pretty clear throughout the film. Are audience members implicated in cycles of violence when such violence like that of funny games is big business in the entertainment world? Or perhaps another interesting question to pose here is, is it an effective method to criticize certain elements of filmmaking, culture, or just society in general by using the same methods you are criticizing? Haneke does attempt to get around the gratuitous nature of these films by creating sequences that deny the viewer from seeing the extreme violence that happens. The film displays Paul making a sandwich when Georgie is killed. Of course, given some of our comments on Texas Chainsaw, cutting away from violence can perhaps make it all the more intense for a viewer. Haneke allows something that typically doesn't happen in film, especially in American film. A child is killed in a brutal manner. Though only seeing the aftermath, the audience is forced to question how allowing this fight against the idea of perpetuating violence in American cinema is justified. That's a very packed subject to discuss, and as stated before, plenty of other films have tried this approach to social commentary, but it's just food for thought here as we get into the implicated subject of the movie, us. Part of what makes the sandwich scene so jarring is that rather than being sided with the typical protagonists of these films, the audience for funny games is aligned with that of the perpetrators. Paul and Peter are the only characters to break the fourth wall and talk to the audience, indicating that they are really the way that the viewer is brought into the story. This moment is not so much a far cry from someone getting some food together while they are watching something just as violent on TV. In this case as well, NASCAR is what's on TV, interesting enough. Another form of media that arguably displays violence, car crashes, and a sensational, perhaps given a funny games approach, even a senseless manner. This choice of NASCAR also gets back to that strange mixing of what's considered highbrow and lowbrow culture yet again. Paul and Peter wear white gloves their entire presence throughout the film. Not only does this work on a technical level to let them not leave any evidence behind, but it also acts as a wardrobe choice that indicates the way they distance themselves from their actions. A very thin white film, a very thin white lens, kind of. This aligns with how the audience perhaps tries to distance themselves from certain acts deemed awful that are perpetuated through popular media. 
by aligning the audience with the perpetrators. That's just one of the many ways Funny Games toys with expectations, conventions, and implication. The article on the Criterion website by Bilge Eberai I mentioned earlier is a great read to understand how this movie deals with other expectations. The family barely fights back and the one that does is Anne rather than the father figure of the family, which would be a pretty popular way this sort of movie would typically play out in American cinema. Haneke seems to really toy with western masculinity in funny games as George is portrayed as a weakling and Peter and Paul often referred to him as the ship's captain in a mocking manner. Eberai also points to the overall lack of catharsis in the movie. The one moment a fragment of typical storytelling in funny games occurs, Paul is able to control the film through its own medium to allow the perpetration to succeed. Once again, Paul is acting similar to that of a viewer in this moment using a TV remote. This allows Haneke to attack the audience's implicated position even further. Haneke wants to attack the viewer more than anything in funny games, and as Ebri points to, he does so through the denial of catharsis and subverting typical expectations, but also their status as an implicated subject of violence in popular media, especially violence that deals with traumatic events. The variety of fourth wall breaks throughout make it clear that Haneke wants to comment on the implicated subject regarding this film and this genre, yet Funny Games becomes something so much more rich when looking at it in the larger picture of culture. Though Funny Games is fictional in a way, as Paul points to in the film's conclusion, it's not really fiction. Nothing in film entirely is fiction. This brings into question our position as an implicated subject when watching violent films that deal with recreating real-world acts of violence that also explore trauma or maybe exploit the trauma of others for entertainment value. Fitting as it is, Funny Game ends with a shot similar to that of what this video starts with. Paul stares directly into the camera, letting the audience know, as Sally does in Texas Chainsaw, that the movie is fully aware that there is someone else in the blame here someone else implicated in the events occurring, someone else engaging with the trauma present on screen for better or for worse, and that someone staring back as it's what made Sally cry and laugh is what really makes that menacing smile grow. Thank you so much for continuing in this exploration of horror cinema and themes involving trauma with me. Please let me know what you thought of this video in the comments, and please, if you are interested in using this channel as an educational resource, as I said earlier, and go ahead and subscribe to it so that way you can continue to experience a more rich exploration of this genre and its relatively popular theme of trauma. Once again, I'll state that I am currently in the middle of trying to find a job and moving around so videos might continue to be uh, sporadic for a period of time but they will continue to be published and I'll try to make this more on the regular. Once again, thank you for your time and I will see you all during our next exploration.